Well, here we are once again on our knees just for you. Peter, what are we here for today? Just not what you're thinking. That's <laughs> stupid. Uh, we have some Francin Pilsner in front of us. That's a local malt from Link Malts. Uh, and we're going to be doing a side-by-side -side with it uh, to show you the difference between doing a single infusion mash and a step mash. That's going to be a video that we will release in a couple weeks when the beers are all done and we can tell you the tasting notes of the side-by-side. -side. But for now, we should probably go over all the different types of rests that there are and what they do and how to do them. So we're gonna go ahead and uh, do that in a little bit quieter area than this. Uh, so yeah, let's, let's jump over to it, ready? Jump cut. <laughs> Every mash rest and, and what it does. This is a subject that you guys have brought up on multiple occasions, especially during our whole malt series, uh, specifically with base malts. Uh, there's a lot of enzymes at play and uh, things you gotta know about doing mash shiz uh, that can create a lot of different flavors and so let's uh let's dive into mashes <laughs> so first of all this is actually our second time shooting this video because the first time we tried to shoot it it ended up about like this <laughs> so yeah peter tends to get a little bit nerdy sometimes and uh, we thought that might be a little bit over the top for people that aren't super familiar with step mashing already. It is a super detailed and in-depth uh, <laughs> subject, so there's a lot we could go into it, but uh, we wanted to chomp it down into something that might be a little bit more digestible. Step mashing is going to be exactly what it sounds like. Instead of just having one mash rest where you're hitting that 150 degree mark, um, you're actually going to generally start at a lower temperature and work your way up through that temperature range in order to get different qualities from your mash as you go through different rests. You're mashing in different steps. Whether or not you do a single infusion mash versus a step mash is actually going to be very dependent on the beer itself that you're brewing and more specifically the malts that are going in that beer. So uh, things to consider in this are whether the malts are highly modified, meaning they have less proteins and more readily available sugars, or more modified, meaning they have you know a little bit more work you have to do to coax out those sugars. Uh, another thing will be just the overall grist. So if you have a lot of stuff that would go on, say a hazy pale, like a lot of oats or things that are not malted at all, uh, you might need to do a little bit more to make sure that you get as much both protein and sugars off those grains as possible. Um, you're also going to want to going to want to consider things like uh, water chemistry and uh, like the acidity of the malts that you're using. Yeah, definitely pay attention to the water around your house. Uh, that's that's going to affect your mash pH and other things like that, which may or may not mean that you have to do an extra rest on it. Uh, finally, it's going to be system dependent, whether or not you have a traditional mash tun that you might have to do infusion mashing on, infusion mashing on, or whether you have a continuous recirculating system that a lot of the new all-in-one systems use today. Yeah. So let's start from the bottom end of the mash rest spectrum and kind of work our way up and tell you what each of them does and why you would do them. Um, the very lowest one is going to be anywhere from 85 degrees on the low end, which we don't recommend, all the way up to about 110 degrees. Uh, and this is going to be a combination of your acid rest and your uh, beta gluconase rest. This is the lowest rest that we really recommend using. Uh, this is something that we generally are going to use for very, very light beers, usually traditional you know, German lagers, things like Pilsners, things like Helles. Uh, and that also has to do with the fact that we have hard water. Yes, uh, so the, this acid rest comes in kind of two stages. The most common one that people reference is called phytic acid, uh, which needs an enzyme called phytase to make work. But in mostly modified malts, that phytase doesn't exist anymore. And so that acid is not something we shoot for. There's another acid in there called ferulic acid that can be made. And that really happens at its peak right around that 109 degree temperature range, which is why we recommend doing that. In addition to the fact that it runs into the beta gluconase rest. So what the ferulic acid traditionally did was it is a precursor to uh, the clove character that you would get in your traditional like Bavarian Hefeweizens. But really what we're using it for is as a mash pH adjustment. This means that instead of using lactic acid or acidulated malt, um, we can either reduce or eliminate those, go through this rest and it'll actually adjust the pH of our mash down in that range to really give us a nice soft body of the beer and an efficient conversion later down the road. And for a lot of other reasons that we won't delve into because they're very, very deep dives into this whole subject, uh, it, it in general produces a softer and lighter beer. So it's really good for like a lot of times crisp lagers are great for yep. using this. Yeah, that's, that's the biggest takeaway. This rest can generally help with softness. 
So going into uh, that temperature range, uh, so swinging into the 109, that's when you start to get some of your proteins broken down, uh, like by beta-glucanase, and this range kind of runs all the way up to about 136. And so uh, we'll go over what uh, beta-glucanase does as well as peptidase and proteinase in this range. So proteins as well as beta-glucans are bodybuilders to beer. So these are things that are gonna be in high concentrations and especially if you have high adjunct malts, things like wheat, rye, um, anything unmalted, these are gonna give you a very, really thick, rich body. Proteins also give you a lot of haze in your beer. So uh, doing a rest in this temperature is going to be really important if you want to end up with clear beer. Another thing that happens in this temperature range, especially in that 120 to 129 is kind of where I like to go on the top end, uh, is going to be the solubility of proteins goes up. Uh, the reason this is important is because your enzymes, which are going to be what drives both your starch conversion uh, and your protein breakdowns and your acid creation, those enzymes uh, are all a type of protein. And so if you want them floating around in your mash a little bit more, making them more soluble can be helpful. On top of floating around in your mash on a recirculating system, this is especially important because this can really help um, eliminate stuck sparges. Yes. Uh, going through a proper protein rest. Um, helps helps with uh, just the overall flow through the mash, like Peter said, um, which is why usually we will do this on yeah any of like our little small brew in a can systems and or even a large five barrel system uh, that we tend to have issues with stuck sparges on. The only time that you really don't want to do a rest in this temperature range is when you have a beer that has almost 100% highly modified malt in it. Uh, the reason being, you can leave your beer a little bit thin and watery. Yep, exactly. That's uh, that's the only downside if you don't have. Um, some degree of adjuncts or under modified malts in there um, that have dextrins in them or, or other bodybuilding molecules. Um, you can end up just kind of stripping all the body out of a beer and end up with a thin watery beer. Before we go up to the sacrification temperatures, uh, we'll put a quick graphic up so you can kind of see what enzymes are at play and what temperatures they work at. Well, with that graphic out of the way, Let's uh, go up to the, the, main, the main course. The main event, the uh, sacrification rest, which is uh, going to actually fall in a wider range than I think most people think. Uh, like we just mentioned at the beginning, the ideal range is right at about 150 degrees to 152 Fahrenheit, and that's because you have two um, enzymes going to town. One of them is going to be beta amylase on the low end of the spectrum. This actually starts out at around 140 degrees, 140, under, 145, yeah, and uh, we'll go up into your mid 150s where you have your alpha amylase that is actually happier um, in the upper 150s and can actually go up to, I think, the upper 160s, yeah, before it starts to get denatured. When you start to get into this temperature range, uh, it's important to note that denaturation does happen on both of these. Uh, even at 155 degrees, alpha amylase is still being denatured just slow enough that you'll get your full conversion off of it. But 100, at 155 degrees, beta amylase is denatured very, very fast. And so if you want to get that beta amylase activity, it's actually really important that you make sure you're mashing in under that 154, 155 degree range. And that's why 152 mm -hmm. seems to be the upper echelon for both of them. So what you're probably asking now is why is there these two things and how do they affect my beer? And ultimately it comes down to how they attack starches. And I'm gonna leave that on to Peter because he got crazy on the last video about that. All right, do you want me to, should I go get my whiteboard? Don't get your whiteboard. You don't want my whiteboard? <laughs> Just tell him. All right, so to understand alpha and beta amylase uh, a little bit more, first of all, you need to understand what they do uh, and what they're trying to give you in your wort. Um, what they do is they take amylose and amylopectin, which are two long, glucose chains, let's call them, and they turn them into maltose, which is beer sugar. Uh, so amylose is a chain of glucose that's straight. It doesn't have any branchings in it, uh, and it's really easy to attack. Uh, amylopectin has branches in it. So you imagine each of these lines is basically a bunch of glucose molecules sandwiched together. Now, beta amylase, which is the one that we focus on the most, is the one that gives you the maltose uh, a little bit easier. It can only go in one direction, meaning it has to start at one end of amylose or amylopectin and work its way, chunking off one molecule of maltose at a time. So it's gotta go in that direction, and as it runs down this way, it'll kick off maltose. We'll just draw an M for maltose. Um, which means two things. First of all, it is very slow, and second of all, it has to have a stopping point. Uh, well, that becomes a problem when you get into amylopectin because that stopping point is exactly three glucose molecules away from any branch, meaning 
if that is your beta amylase, it's got to stop right here. Now, alpha amylase basically breaks apart molecules in the same way, but it attacks at random, meaning alpha amylase can attack right here in the middle of an amylose molecule, or it can attack right here, a lot closer to those branching in the uh, amylopectin chains, which means that alpha amylase gives a lot more food for beta amylase to come through and make you guys some maltose. So what Peter's saying for you mere mortals out there is that if you mash too low, uh, what'll happen is you're gonna end up with poor efficiency of your beer. You're just not gonna get much sugar extraction because you're not getting both of those enzymes going to town, whereas if you mash too high, you're actually going to denature your beta amylase and uh, end up with a highly unfermentable wort, which means that your beer is not gonna finish as low as you want it to, and you're not gonna get as much alcohol, same thing. Now, there are reasons to do both those things, mashing super low and mashing super high, and we actually do use both of those on the commercial scale to create different flavors, but those are longer, more not this kind of time <laughs> topics. Uh, let's go into different mashing techniques and uh, and talk about other things that you can get out of your mashing. So uh, one of these is going to be going into kind of the next step in the uh, uh, temperature building process, and that's going to be your mash out. Most of the time when we are doing a mash out, it's really unintentional. It's part of our sparging. Um, and what it really means is you're just raising your wort temperature up to about 170 degrees. Uh, you're going to help those sugars not be so viscous. It's going to allow things to flow a little better. Yeah. Uh, some people say that you do a mash out to stop the enzymes. There's really no reason to stop those enzymes at this point because uh, you should be mashing to completion every single time. If you don't mash to completion and you need to stop your enzymes at some point during the mash step, then you're kind of creating more variability in your beer than you want. And so uh, the mash out for that reason isn't something that I really believe in. Uh, but the, uh, the viscosity thing is super important. Imagine when you heat up honey or when you heat up maple syrup, it flows a lot better. Yep. So ultimately, if you have a system that's easy to recirculate your mash on, go ahead and do a mash out. Otherwise, I really don't worry about it. It's something that, you know, you hit your, your sparge water, your hot sparge water is gonna heat up that mash as it starts to filter through it, so. Uh, now let's talk about a little bit um, other ways to break down sugars. And so one of the things that you can do to break down sugars and create new sugars for beer to ferment, uh, as well as other compounds that will build flavor, is uh, just with heat slash caramelization, uh, which can come from things like doing a decoction mash step. So decoction is the traditional old world method of heating up your mash, where um, nowadays you might do infusions with different amounts of, of water that you add to it. Decoction literally means that you are pulling off some of your grains and the water, boiling them, and then adding them back in. So decoction also creates a lot of new flavors in your beer too, and that's a lot of the reason why you would do that in today's world. But for all intents and purposes, it's uh, kind of an outdated process. Not a lot of people do it, and uh, even if they do, it's and even if they do, it's usually more trouble than it's worth. Uh, another way to get a step mash going is something like a RIMS system. Which is a, what is that? Recirculating in mash system, right? Mm -hmm. That's, yep. yes. So that's redundant. So if you are brewing on a RIMS, they're going to be recirculating hot water to maintain the temperature of your mash. My experience with these is that they are bulky, they're tough to clean, they're, they're clumsy, so I generally don't recommend using them. Uh, a Herm system is another way to do it, which is basically running uh, a heat source through the interior of your mash. Uh, and they, I don't like doing that with an element. What I've found is a fun way to do it is actually just to run hot water, or boiling water through to uh, increase the mash temperature. But we're not gonna get too much into the details of these things because I feel like they are actually a video all on their own to explain. So I think that sums up all of our mash rests. Hopefully you learned a little bit from this and uh, yeah. If you've got specific questions, please leave them in the comment below. Uh, like the video, subscribe to the channel and follow us on Facebook, Instagram and other things that are less things. Wow, that was great. Great closeout. Viva la beer. Thank you. I'm super good at videos. Like, subscribe if you got here. Oh, and live streams on Sundays. And live streams on Sundays.